Thank you so much for joining us for this special episode. We are here with Morgan Stevens of the Virgin Hotel. Um, Morgan heads up the marketing department here. Morgan, why don't you just start off by letting us know a summary of how you got here? Sure thing. Well, thanks for having me, first and foremost. Um, I have been in hotel marketing, hospitality marketing, going on 10 years now, most recently here at Virgin Hotel Chicago. Um, it all kind of started on accident. I originally was getting ready to go to school in marketing when I started my first internship in hotel marketing, um, which is really no surprise. I am coming in as a third generation hotelier. So my oh, okay. grandmother was a GM. My mother has been in the industry for a long time. So no one was surprised but me. Um, but marketing is easy to fall in love with. So I kind of got hooked and hospitality makes it a lot of fun, gives you really great engaging subject matter to work with yeah. so I like I said I got hooked and here I am almost 10 years later so you hadn't intended on being in hospitality marketing it was just no. marketing in general first it was nursing it was actually nursing. it was nursing and then I made the big leap which I've always been a really creative person yeah. and creativity is not all that it takes to succeed in marketing but it's a great kind of seed to work with absolutely and so you know it, it all kind of came naturally from there but it was definitely a left turn for me. Yeah. Great. Um, so we, we're going to go along with a number of questions um, that I kind of put together prior to the interview. I shared them prior. So um, just to open up the fourth the fourth wall there for a moment. Sure. But um, I want to start us off with just a question. What advice you'd have for students and aspiring markers who want to pursue a career in the hospitality industry? Because even though this isn't the industry that um, you started in. Um, I think that you've really succeeded in it thus far. You're Thank you. heading up a big city hotel here downtown Thank you. Chicago. So Thank you. Um, I, it's an enviable spot to be in. I appreciate that. Um, it's definitely, you know, marketing is a lot of fun. I think I would say that the advice for anyone interested in really venturing into hospitality marketing is that it's not for everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, marketing in itself is kind of one beast and then hospitality marketing is a specialty mm. um and i think that something or some advice not really advice but something i heard a lot early in my career was um about the entrepreneurial spirit that hospitality requires and this is not just a marketing thing but really you know top to bottom the operation it takes kind of a hungriness yeah. it takes like um a scrappiness almost. exactly and you have to care you know it, yeah. you can't you know, I think show up and succeed in this industry without caring at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you really have to be ready to get involved in the operation. Hospitality is a 24 seven, 365 day a year business. So sometimes that means getting involved in unconventional ways. Sometimes that means unconventional hours or events. And we're here for all of that. So, yeah. you know, I think that if you're, you know, looking to get creative in marketing, but you really want to be kind of tied to a nine to five and tied to your desk hospitality marketing might not be the one for you it mm. takes really um you know a heavy involvement um and a willing to immerse yourself and get your you know hands dirty a little bit i think so how is it different would you say like um for somebody who's approaching this and they're like okay do i want to potentially try being a marketing intern at a hotel versus mm -hmm. going into the industry for doing agency work or Mm -hmm. however they decide to get their start there. Sure. Um, walk me through what things they might want to think through um, sure. kind of approaching that decision. So there are, I mean, there are a couple of different ways that you can, you know, um, actualize a career like career in hotel marketing uh, or hospitality marketing. It could be, I, I kind of started in this first way of um, an above property role. I started at a, a company outside of Chicago where I worked with 20 hotels at a time mm -hmm. in a, an office environment and I provided them support uh, remotely and it still involved, you know, entailed getting involved, um, but it's a little bit more removed still. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it involves a high level, level of creativeness all the same. Um, and then at about the five or six year mark in my career, I had the opportunity to open Hilton's at McCormick Place, uh, where we met Tom. We did meet Tom. And, um, you I know. I was just a, just a front desk agent at the time. Yes, yes. And we had a few fun stops along the way as well. But look at us both now. Look at us now. Yeah. So, um, you know, having the chance to do a little bit of both of those things, um, I think it's still each demand a high level of creativity beyond just um, 
what makes a good campaign or what is outside of the box in terms of an activation. Um, hotels, they don't have the same resources as you're talking about maybe tech marketing or, you know, some other fields. I, when I say creative, you have to look at your resources and say, okay, this is what I have. Yeah. How can I really make that work for me? Right. Um, because what we spend in digital marketing on a monthly basis could be, you know, a few people's salaries. So it's really, you have to be thoughtful. Um, again, beyond just the creativity that putting out great content entails. Yeah. So um, kind of touching on that, because you mentioned how you really got your start overseeing mm -hmm. multiple hotels from mm -hmm. that perspective. Um, were you putting together strategies at that time? Mm -hmm. You put together strategies now in your role right now. Yes. Um, how do you approach creating those strategies um, just so that they resonate with a diverse audience within Chicago mm -hmm. and then also appeal to both locals and tourists? Or do you segment it where you create one campaign for locals, one campaign for tourists and keep it separated? Sure. There are a few questions there, I think. Yeah. I, I have been putting together strategy since the beginning. Um, as I have gotten into on-property roles, I've only been able to get more immersed in that strategy and really, you know, uh, create f strategies that are further layered and more robust. So, um, yes, to answer that kind of first question. Yeah. And then how do we develop campaigns that speak to diverse audiences? Uh, there are a lot of answers to that question. And it's it's something we spend a lot of time on because it's important to us here. Speaking to you know my experience in this role, um, but programming is a pillar of what we do. Our programming is diverse. We have LGBTQ plus focused programming, drag events, din dining experiences, things of that nature. We also work with queer and POC producers to put on our regular DJ programming at Cerise. We're programmed on average four to seven days a week. So that's a lot of talent to bring in. That's yeah. a lot of, you know, to give back to talent in Chicago and that, you know, we love bringing in and working with as well. Um, I think that a team here that's reflective of the community that we want to serve or, you know, bring into experience the hotel here is also critically important. We have a, a quote in the back of house that says diversity is necessity. And, you know, that's I mean, we live it and breathe it here. I think it's easy to kind of. Um, you know, say that, but as I think very genuinely followed through uh, here in a way that I love to see personally, because it makes my job easier Yeah. Um, when it's not just that lip service. But then uh, kind of the last question, I think, being do we segment our campaigns to reach, you know, specific audiences? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, anytime that I can get more targeted, the better. Yeah. Um, the more qualified I can make the audience that I'm reaching, the more likely they are to convert. And that works better for me. Does it make it easier in the pitching phase when you're putting together a strategy? you say for, I don't know, if you do pitch to your corporate team or your GM or both? I think it all starts with getting buy-in on property and then zooming out and getting the buy-in on the brand side. Yes. Right. So you start, so does it make it easier to vie for a more successful campaign if you've got that kind of like specific targeted audience? This is the plan. This is what we're going to do. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The more targeted we can get, the better. Right. Every time. Um, now I'm going to zoom out and I know that we touched it on this just a little bit. Sure. Um, but we, we answered how you got your start. We didn't answer how these worlds are different. So, you know, marketing doesn't always fit so easily inside mm -hmm. the hospitality world. Sure. Um, what do you think is, is different about hospitality marketing outside of the, the scrappiness? Do you think that there's, um, like more... I don't know, like a magic to it, or you think it's just the same as as regular marketing? Like, what's your absolutely? What's your take? What, I, why stay in hospitality marketing? Why not jump over to agency? Right, and that's that's a great question because I think that if you could call it magic, right, for sure, um, you know, it is so much easier to do your job, period, but to do marketing when you are sold on what you're marketing, when you mm. are enthusiastic about whatever that content is or whatever that experience is that you're selling or marketing, right? Um, I think that it's easier to succeed. So I think that's the draw, right? I have kind of pulled in younger talent that have experienced some other industries and they say, I love marketing. I love getting to be creative. However, you know, it's a lot easier when I can get excited about what the, the content. Is. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that hotels and food and beverage, you know, they can be really sexy, yeah. you know, so to speak in terms of the content that you're working with hundred percent. Very nice. Yes. 
Um, okay, so let's bring it over to the social media side. Um, with the reality of social media and the influencer marketplace, mm -hmm. what's your philosophy on working within that channel to promote the hotel? Um, what do you consider a successful social media influencer campaign? Sure. Um, so going back to that idea of having to get creative with the resources that you have available to you in marketing or hospitality marketing specifically, um, I'm all about influencer collaborations or working with influencers when they're qualified. Of course, mm -hmm. if they speak to audiences that we feel are going to get us in front of the right people, if they have that audience size that we feel is going to get us in front of a worthwhile enough audience pool, right? Um, and they're not going to displace any other business that kind of outranks that worthwhileness, right? I'm all for it every time because it's one of those things where we can output the least resources hypothetically, right? Right. If there's no other head in that bed, it's kind of minimal in terms of any other marketing dollar that I can put out on digital spend or anything else. So if I can be layering that over everything else that I'm doing, I'm all for it. And then in addition to that, what I think influencers bring to the table is a personal testimonial, right? So right. you could kind of compare, you know, going to the question of how do you measure success in those campaigns? It's tough, right? It's a it's an upper funnel marketing strategy, which means that we don't necessarily expect to see it convert right away. But it's still crucial because talking about the marketing funnel, everything that happens up here in the awareness kind of uh, level filters down to conversion eventually, right? And so social media isn't the channel that we see converting the highest, but we know that it's still critical in moving people down the funnel. Um, and for that reason, and also because it's just a great way to, you know, to achieve that awareness without putting out that upfront spend, again, I'm all for it. So you see it almost like how in hotel group sales, mm -hmm. they layer in the business with group mm -hmm. so that they can achieve a higher rate on the transient. You're almost layering in the influencer content mm -hmm. so that you can achieve a, a greater, I don't know, uh, just KPIs in general? Yeah, you could kind of look at it that way. And I think that the other thing to look at is, you know, we live in such a content hungry world. Yeah. And I think as a hotel, it really can be tough to keep pace with the hungriness for that content. So, you know, I think as a as young hotel marketing leaders, you will often get challenged to put out more content, to embrace social media more. I think social media is one of those things that anyone in or outside of marketing, they have some sort of base level of understanding for. So when you're thinking of ways to challenge marketing, I think that's usually one of the first first channels that people's minds go to. Do you find it, um, and I'm, I'm spending a little bit longer on this, mm -hmm. this influencer question just because um, I feel like it's just so present inside mm -hmm. of everybody's day-to-day -day life, like that's what they see mm -hmm. when they're approaching like a hotel page. Mm -hmm. Do you find it difficult to find enough influencers to get through the building that are qualified or are you constantly fielding leads and like just there's an abundance of content out there? I, I'm in a, a fortunate position at a luxury lifestyle hotel that influencers, you know, we do that outreach and there's a lot of receptiveness to it. There's a lot of organic incoming leads um, for those collaborations. So between kind of those two things, it makes it easier for me here. Very similar to my last hotel, again, very much a lifestyle leaning brand. So I think that those brands, um, they speak to those influencers and make it a little bit easier to achieve those collaborations. If I was still working in kind of my above property role, I would be sending out a lot more feelers yeah. to try to secure um, the same number of leads. Yeah. Like what yeah. would you do, say, for example, if you're thrown into a situation, uh, whether you're in a suburb or deep suburban property, mm -hmm. um, is that even a sort of business that you'd want to chase down? It could be, you know, there are definitely, you know, Backing up, I guess, before I get into the fact that there are value to, you know, influencers that speak to suburban audiences specifically, I think there are value to micro influencers, period. Mm -hmm. um, speaking to qualifying them, of course, are they speaking to the right audience first and foremost? That's non-negotiable. Um, but audience size is really where you can get a little bit more into conversation, right? It doesn't need to be a million followers. It doesn't need to be 300,000 followers. It could be 30,000 followers. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're speaking to someone that, or, or a group of 30,000 people you really think are likely to come through the door, right. you know, if it's a group of, let's say your local neighborhood, you know, kind of outreach or someone that's specifically targeted to loop activity, that's a great opportunity for us to promote our restaurants.
Awesome. But sorry, to finish that thought Please. off, the, again, the like the content hungriness, I think that we benefit just from getting that additional, those additional assets, right? How do you keep up when you don't have budget for photography all the time? Capitalize on people that are always needing to crank out that content yeah. and find a good kind of synergy. And you kind of include in that agreement the numbers of videos or photos that are unlimited use for you to use in the future. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. What is your, so um, this is a great one. What has your experience been like balancing what you want to do in contrast with what you can do uh, within your given brand or corporate team? And I'll preface this again. doesn't have to be at this hotel. Sure. Maybe in some of your previous roles. Mm -hmm. I'm going to speak a little bit to both because sure. I am coming from a largely branded background, whether, you know, in my first role or in my on-property roles, primarily Hilton product. Um, a lot of IHG in my portfolio previously as well. So I was working, used to working within the kind of confines of a larger brand family where if you are a franchise property, you might not have access to the same level of proprietary detail that you want, right? right. So um, a lot of the same campaigns that I was running at past properties, I, you know, you're unfortunately forced to kind of extrapolate a bit to make some educated assumptions about what your campaigns are doing for you because you can see, you know, how many people they reach, you can see the impressions, the click through, but once the, they leave the ad, they go into the brand's really site and that data it's becomes proprietary. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't have access to that. It's been a gift moving into this role where I'm in a, a smaller, again, um, luxury lifestyle collection of hotels where, you know, the kind of the size of the um, collection makes it so that I have access to a lot more data. Mm -hmm. I have access to, you know, the people that are making decisions about how we're driving a lot of our key marketing initiatives. And I think that that data transparency really helps me make a case for how we're spending our marketing dollars. Mm -hmm. I think that it really, I mean, it's, it's just amazing as someone who loves the data um, to see exactly what our emails are doing for us, exactly what our, our web campaigns are doing for us. It's just amazing. Um, so I think that that is kind of the confine that I'm used to working in yeah. uh, is like these. Um, and I love I love the brands. Um, so it, it's no uh, no shade to them. It's just it's been awesome to kind of have that layer removed um, so that I can see more about what we're doing and achieving. Um, and when you're spending five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars a month on your digital media campaigns, you really want to know exactly what those numbers are. What about like the politics of approaching an, an idea, mm -hmm. packaging an idea, mm -hmm. making sure that it's um, well, even I mean, of course, it'd be well thought out, but it was, it's just broken down in a way that's digestible for a given corporate team mm -hmm. um, or even internally, like. How do you approach making sure that all of your I's are dotted and T's are crossed for um, the ideation phase? So how do you make sure your pitch is well well packaged? Well is that packaged. kind of the question? Yeah, because it, be, it can be political sometimes mm -hmm. in the way that you frame the campaign that you want to do because right. you might realize this might not be something that corporate's going to go for. This might not be something that my leaders within my hotel are going to mm -hmm. go for. Um, do you have a special approach for that or, or do you have kind of a rule of thumb that you've kind of created? I think one of my rules is to allow yourself to color outside the lines a little bit. So I, when working within, um, kind of the confines of a brand, um, allowed myself to break the rules a little bit, right. Um, to first and foremost, promote my property. I mm -hmm. think that as an on property marketing, um, associate, you know, uh, it's my property first as the part of a big brand collection. I'm competing with 600, seven, you know, however many other properties. And so um, I am first and foremost kind of operating in the best interest of my property. Right. Very much, you know, within reason. Yeah. Um, but if that's going with the digital agency that's going to, you know, produce the best returns for me or producing the, the artwork that is going to resonate best with my audience because... I know my audience as opposed to the brand who, you know, they know the larger audience and I know Chicago, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that 
in my previous roles, that was a little bit of the approach uh, here at Virgin where it, this was a very marketing forward uh, brand. And so uh, it's really the sky's the limit. Um, I have yet to pitch anything that has come across as crazy over the top or out of the question. It's awesome. And I love that. Yes, it's always in the cards. Um, and with that comes, I think, was part of the question too, how do you, you know, make sure that you are receiving that warm reception? Um, be um to establish trust i think is a crucial part of having that continuous buy-in in my case from my gm you know having marketing minded leaders around you makes it possible um but building that trust with you know thoughtfulness impeccable follow-up really you know that elbow grease kind of that I talked about a little bit earlier, there's a lot of respect and equity that comes from that. So it really helps to um, support those things that I then go to bat for. So I don't see it as like one battle every time I go for something. It's mm -hmm. really this kind of continuous strategic discussion that's happening. Um, you know, so it's never really, you know, how can we get this one initiative across the finish line? For us, we're a strategic team and we meet on a weekly basis, both at FMB and on the room side to, you know, put these strategies together, together <laughs> and um, get them across the finish line in a way that makes sense for all of us, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes that means I'm coming to the, the table with a, a little bit of an off the wall idea to begin with, but then we start molding that together, mm. which is really awesome. I think yeah. it's a collaborative effort. Uh, succeeding in marketing takes a lot of a lot of folks that are outside of marketing as well. So, um, yeah, it's great to have that collaboration, that openness with your department heads or your departments. Yes, um, and it's cool to to frame that as overall strategy. This is what we're doing, whether mm -hmm. that's given in this given timeline. Um, and this is what sells is the strategy. You know, how do we make that strategy happen with these individual campaigns? Exactly. Cool. Yes. Um, in your opinion, what are some of the most underutilized marketing strategies or channels in the hospitality industry that young marketers should explore? Oh, this was one that I thought about maybe the most. Yeah. And I'm going to answer it, I think, in the opposite. Oh, so sure. at, this is... I would say the most used channel, it's digital direct, digital media campaigns. But I think that, um, you know, what I would say about it is really learn how to advocate for it. I mean, going back to what we were just talking about, it's kind of a beautiful segue. Mm -hmm. I think that digital marketing is one of those things that, you know, don't leave it to your agency to be the expert on. Don't leave it to your brand counterpart to be the expert on. I think that in marketing, you really need to embrace digital and, and make it a mission to understand it because where are we going to make the most of our money? It's digital direct and it's in partnership with sales. So that's kind of the second answer to this question. And that's not underutilized either. I think that really there should always be good synergy happening between sales and marketing. It's yeah. very natural sales and marketing. It's a thing, right? So, you know, first and foremost, make like digital media, you know, your thing. Do you mean like on the contents? I mean, obviously I mean, holistically, but do you mean Get, be an expert on the content side or be an expert on the on the data side like how do so you become I, an expert how do you approach that so i'm talking so i that, that's a great question i should spe specify that i'm really talking about you know search engine marketing i'm talking about meta search um those are the digital campaigns that i'm talking about and where we spend those you know five tens thousands of dollars yeah making yourself an expert what does that look like um i think that Optimizing your content and understanding how to do that is a big part of, you know, being an expert. But I think it is more about the data. Mm -hmm. How do you understand it well enough that you can take it back to your GM? That's a big part of like selling leadership on those individual campaigns. Once we're on board with the overall strategy, how do you understand it well enough that you can make it easy enough for them to understand mm -hmm. in a way that they'll get on board with without a lot of question? Um, of course, there are always questions, but, you know, in a way that's easy to understand more what I mean. Um, and then beyond that, do you really yourself, you know, see the trends that are happening? Are you analyzing, you know, 
I, I guess what I'm saying is don't don't just rely on regurgitating the, the talking points and the data that you receive. Mm. Do you understand? And if you don't challenge yourself to spend time one on one with your media leads, take those experts and make them your best friend yeah. and really get to know it better. But because this takes up so much of my budget, I want to feel confident when I'm presenting that information in particular to my stakeholders. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Really well, well said. Thank you. Um, and I actually don't have a follow up on that. So you explained it well enough for me. To, to <laughs> you think. And then a part, <laughs> like, part, like I said, partnership with sales is invaluable. So yeah. I think, you know, make the most of those relationships as well. Um, and I guess this kind of segues right in to this last question again, um, kind of on a roll with this, but how do you balance traditional marketing approaches with newer digital marketing tactics in your overall marketing mix? Absolutely. So it is so much digital that takes up a lot of my time, Yeah. but can't undervalue those traditional, you know, marketing avenues, some of which I mentioned already. I think key is a lot of those sales driven initiatives or campaigns could be seen very much as traditional marketing tactics. So putting together an incentive and a, and a flyer and doing a good old blitz and, right. you know, working with the team to figure out how are we going to get this information to our, you know, our clients in a grassroots way that kind of borders back on traditional marketing or, you know, if we're trying to promote different FMB offerings, doing fam experiences or, you know, familiarization trips, you know, works on the hotel side is still a great grassroots option or a traditional marketing option rather. Um, works really well on the FMB side too. So just getting people out to experience things, that's really a tactic that's as old as time. Yeah. Um, and then uh, just, I think something else along the, uh, the traditional marketing side that I'm forgetting. Do you, do you feel like you're you're mostly invested in the digital side and then just kind of like layer in the traditional on top. Um, and if that's the case, how do you identify the traditional marketing tactics that are worthwhile? Like even so far as sending your sales team members mm -hmm. out on these trips mm -hmm. um, or conferences, like how yeah. do you pinpoint the most valuable traditional marketing tactics within your digital kind of primary strategy? Digital, it's not that it's, you know, most important to me, but because it is consuming the majority of my budget, it needs to it take needs up to a, a kind of a, pro a proportionate amount of my energy. Yeah. Um, I would say, though, you know, although I don't need to spend the same energy on it because there are sales leaders that are already kind of effectively driving the team, the partnership with sales is that other really significant um you know, percentage of the equation that falls more under traditional marketing. Yeah. Again, going back to the idea that majority of our revenue is going to come from the direct marketing that we do to our brand.com site and, you know, what we achieve in partnership with sales, really what sales is achieving and, and us helping amplify those efforts to give them full credit for what they do. Um, you know, it, it uh, I think is are those two things that yeah. are, are kind of the, the pillar priorities and the other things are not secondary because once you've spent all the money that you can spend in, in media and the powers that be the GM or the stakeholders or whoever says no more money, then those things become equally as important because you will still be challenged to say, what more could we do? Yeah. You know, and that's always how we have to be minded. So it's not at all that these other tactics are less important. Um, but, they're very important that we're continuing to layer them over that base of media, which needs to still get a lot of attention. So great. Yeah. Um, what is your perspective on leveraging AI tools such as, for example, copy AI is mm -hmm. an AI tool that'll create a uh, copy for you. Sure. Um, for marketing and not sponsored uh, for marketing initiatives. Um, do you see AI as a threat or a tool for the hotel marketer? And what is your opinion on using basic AI tools for tasks like responding to reviews? So I, as far as AI goes, I'm not an early adopter mm -hmm. myself. Um, but what I understand about AI is that it's really at this stage in the game, all about what you feed into it. And um, it kind of aggregates that content and spits out new content. So, you know, for me, I look at it like, hypothetical additional team member, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just add that person to your team and then you get the results that you need from them. I would, uh, you know, kind of equate it to needing to nurture and develop, you know, that 
voice. You know, if you're talking about copy, that's definitely a natural example of what we could use it for. I think it would make a lot of sense for review responses for one. Um, but it takes that development to get it into that place where it's productive and valuable tool for you specifically. Um, so I'm interested to see how it continues to be leveraged. I'm also hearing things, uh, you know, more along the lines of chat GP, yeah, I think yeah. that, that uh, it's becoming kind of less effective over time and that yeah. really has to do with the user input. So, you know, in its current form, I don't think AI I'm ready to take on yet because, you know, again, it's just like managing another team member. Um, and I personally, you know, I want to have that. I'm a little bit of a control freak. I want to have that uh, that control and like my hands on that detail and that copy. Yeah. Um, which is great, uh, a great position to be in when you can. But you know, knowing that you have to create efficiencies on a small team as well, knowing that, you know, to have a one person marketing team is a is a gift or a privilege. To have a two person marketing team is amazing. Um, so, you know, if you don't have access to that additional support or manpower, um, I love the idea of taking advantage of AI to kind of supplement your team. I do, th I do think it's kind of wise to, in your position, not yet step on that mm -hmm. rock because it could be a slippery step. Exactly. Or, you know, that, that stone might not be as secure as mm -hmm. we would think. Um, so to not set up a structure to rely on it just yet because we are seeing ChatGPT is becoming less effective. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there is a little bit of a risk in that. And is this tool ready for prime time right now? Right. It's a le legitimate question to ask. I'm waiting to see how other people make the most of it before I really embrace it fully myself. Mm -hmm. But I also acknowledge that prompt writing is kind of a skill in itself. So, yeah. you know, I understand that to be able to get what you want out of AI, you really need to know how to work it. And I'm interested to see how others are working it. Yeah. Great. Um, so this is a bit of a final question. We've mm -hmm. we've made it to the end of our journey. Okay. Um, what is your outlook or advice for someone that might be interested in a career in marketing? Kind of bringing it full circle to sure. that initial opening. Sure. So, you know, I spoke a little bit about um, you know why hotel marketing or hospitality marketing is unique, um, but I think that. If you're looking for something that could be really engaging and fun and get you excited about what you're doing, it's a great environment for that. I think that if you want to be successful and in hospitality marketing, that's what I'll speak to because that's what I've been in my whole career. Yeah. Um, I would just add, uh, don't undervalue the team. I think that really what we do is possible because of the housekeeping teams and the front office teams and the engineering team. Any, anyone who helps make this place go makes it possible for us to do what we do because if we're selling the dream and someone gets here and on the other side of it, it's really not living up to that expectation. You know, you're not going to get that um, secure that repeat guest and you will long term see diminishing returns. You know, ROI, I think everyone knows what it is, the magic three letters right now. You know, so we rely on the delivery of the experience. Um, so I would advise anyone entering hospitality marketing to have a, a really high, pre high appreciation for the teams that make the hotel go. Wonderful. Morgan, thank you for joining us on Hospitality MD. It's been a pleasure. Better pleasure, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right.